Verses 20 and 21 were being a vessel that God can use. Verses 22 through 26 is becoming a vessel that God can use. Here's what verse 22 says. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from, from a pure heart. The first thing that he says is flee. We saw this in 1 Timothy. When he used that word, it has the idea of running away. Don't argue with it. Don't try to convince it. Just run away. He says, I want you to run away from those youthful passions. And some of you, and we have university students here, are saying, hey, why are you always criticizing the young people? Is there something about us that you don't like? Or why are you always criticizing us? No, he's not criticizing you. He's talking about a mindset that we have when we're younger. When I was in my teens and when I was in my 20s, you have this feeling like I can get away with anything. I can do whatever I want. I'm exploring the world. Everything is new to me. Let's go. Let's run. Let's try everything. That's what he's talking about with these youthful passions, that kind of live for the moment kind of attitude. One author put it this way when he said, they include pride, craving for wealth and power, inordinate ambition, jealousy, envy, an argumentative and self-assertive spirit, and many other sinful lusts. And I say, yeah, that's the problem that I had. I loved a good argument. If you want to debate me about something, I would jump in right away. He says, you know, that isn't helpful to the gospel message. I want you to flee that. I want you to pursue depth. I want you to pursue maturity. But the positive side is flee youthful passions and pursue I want you to run away from these things, but I want you to run after these things. And he lists them, righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And he says, I don't want you to do that alone. I want you to do that along with all those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. What's righteousness? Righteousness is a God-oriented living according to the word. Faith or faithful means trustworthy and true. The word love is the Greek word agape, which is a self-sacrificing kind of love. And the word peace is a word that we talked a few lessons ago about. It's not just the absence of conflict when everything is calm. It's the God-given calm that happens even in the midst of a storm. He says, I want you to pursue these things like they are gold, like they are valuable, that they are precious. And he says, I don't want you to pursue them alone. I want you to find other people on this Christian journey who can run after these things just like you. We've said this a number of times before in a variety of lessons that we've had. The Christian life was never intended to be lived alone. Can it be lived alone? Yes. But God is a God of community, and he wants us to be connected. In our particular church, we have a a, a little slogan that we call, Come, Connect and contribute. It's just our little way of saying, if you want to be fully engaged in the life of following Jesus Christ, you'll do these three things. Come, and we say, this is when we love God and we do it together in our worship services. And we say, we would love for you to come to church on a regular basis so you can hear the teaching of God's word and that you can sing and you can pray and fellowship. But it's the second one that fits here, connect. We say, if our church is large, and you don't get to know every other person here. He says, what we want you to do is connect with a small group of people in a small group where you can discuss what the message was about. And we give you questions, and we give you extra scriptures to study, and we say, you're going to do life together. You need to connect together. That's what Paul is saying in this verse. He says, I don't want you to try to do this alone. I want you to connect with other people. So that's the second one. He says, I want you to flee some things. I want you to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And then number verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. He says, I want you to refuse to do that. This must have been a huge problem because if you've been you've been with me this whole time in these classes, how many times has this topic come up? Over and over and over again. The fact that we've done all these lessons consecutively like is like, Paul, you're starting to sound like a broken record. It's just the same thing. Stay away from this. Stay away from this. Don't get into these arguments. There must have been such a problem in that church that he had to say again and again and again, stay away from that. 
Don't get involved in that particular discussion. I, I, was, I told you in one of the previous classes that I was part of our district's mediation team. Our denomination has certain districts, and ours is the state of North Dakota and part of South Dakota. And there's a small group of us men who, if there was a problem in a church, we would travel to that church, and we would ask them questions, and we would try to find out what the particular problem was. So I didn't go to this one church, but I was in conversation with this one man on the telephone, and he was telling me all the things that were wrong with his pastor. And over and over again, the pastor did this, and the pastor didn't do this, and the Bible says this, and our pastor isn't following this. And, and I just, I was getting so overwhelmed with all the things that this man was telling me about him that all of a sudden a thought occurred to me, and I said, now listen to me. I said, if everything you said about your pastor is true, and you have the attitude that you do, and there are people in, in your church who have the attitude that you do, I said, the witness of your church in that town is destroyed. Well, well, but, 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 and he, uh, he was... He was, all, he was frustrated because he wanted to tell me how bad their pastor was and they need to get rid of their pastor. I said, listen, if this is the attitude you have and even half of the things you say are true, I can't imagine why anyone would want to go to your church. That what we, what we don't understand is that if we don't have our focus on the gospel, we ended up getting distracted by so many disputes and so many arguments and so many conversations that we have to always remember that Christ-centered, gospel-saturated ministry is not measured by the number of dollars in our account. It's not measured by the number of people in our seats. It's measured by our character. It's measured by our identity. It's our, measured by our focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Paul does then in verses 24 through 26 is he gives, a, it's not a command, but it's an implied command. And he says this, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. And he just gives this long list of things that they're supposed to do. He simply is saying this, don't fall prey to these kinds of problems in your church. But he says, I want you to try to be kind. I want you to be kind of the leader that can teach. I want you to be patient in enduring evil. I want you to be able to correct your opponents with gentleness. There have been times where people have come to me with a problem or trying to correct something, and the last thing I feel is gentleness. I feel I want to attack. I want to come at them and say, you're wrong. You don't understand. Sometimes we get in, in arguments where things explode and the attitude of restoration and healing isn't even possible. Paul says what's going to happen is, maybe if we treat them with gentleness, look at the possible result. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I love that. Timothy, if you would be the kind of leader in your church, that treats people with respect, that treats them with gentleness, with a kind word and not a harsh word. It just may be that they would come to a place of repentance and God would give it to them. It would lead them to a knowledge of the truth and that they would understand that they have been in the snare of the devil. I wonder how many people come to our churches and not understand the snare of the devil that they're in. And I'm not talking in this case about demon possession or demon oppression. I just mean how many things trip up our people that become a snare of the devil, that weaken them, that weaken the churches, that weaken their family. Paul says, as, as the Lord's servant, don't quarrel, be kind. Be able to teach patiently enduring evil, correct with gentleness, and who knows, they just might repent. I want you to flee the youthful passions. I want you to pursue righteousness and truth. I want you to refuse to get involved in these kind of vain discussions and things that divide. But he says, I want you to prepare. I want you to be ready. Timothy, I want you to start your day with prayer and with an attitude that says, 
Lord, I don't know what's going to happen today. I don't know who's going to come and visit with me. I don't know what particular discussions or problems are going to come. But please, please help me to have the attitude of Jesus Christ, his humility, his patience, his joy. I began by saying, sometimes we don't feel very useful. Sometimes we feel more like that bucket for garbage than we do feeling like a gold vessel. I want to ask you a question. Do you know that God is using you today? You say, well, well, I don't know. I don't have very much time and I don't have very much passion and I'm not sure exactly what to do. I just want to ask you that question. Is God being allowed to use you? Is your heart open so that he, he has opportunities to use you in ways that you might even not understand? The Bible says that he prepares works for us in advance for us to do. That sometimes the mission of our day is simply to say, Lord, I wonder what good works you have in mind for me to do, for me to do. Let's go on an exploration to find out what they are. Question number two. Am I willing to take the steps that are necessary to become a useful tool for the Lord? You say, well, I've got some sin in my life. I, I know that. I feel guilty about that. Well, Paul said, listen, get cleansed. Cleanse it deeply. Cleanse it completely so that God can use you in, in gospel ways. Run away from from vain things and, and youthful passions. He said, hold on to the things of righteousness and truth and love. He said, refuse to get involved in these arguments and prepare for the opportunities God gives you in the course of a day. Are you ready to be a tool that God can use? Are you as a church ready to be a church that God can use? No church is ever going to be perfect. My church is far from perfect. But God has a mission for each church in its place, at its moment in history. And I want our church to have the kind of vessels that God can use. And I, that's my prayer for you too. That in your church, there'd be a repentance from sin, that there would be an encouragement to truth, that there would be the light of salvation that changes the way we think and changes the way we live, that we are transformed into the image of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Useful service in the kingdom of God. TVS is a perfect way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support our educational and outreach ministry today. We exist solely upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvseminary.com. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.